Welcome everybody to the latest live stream here on Gallery Guitar, hosted by myself and Matthew Cochran. Um, it's great to have you all joining us again. Last time out we were talking about two great titans of classical guitar, John Williams and Julian Bream. Today we are talking about a probably much more broad subject. We're talking about genre hopping and the fact that I don't even just think classical guitarists, all guitarists have the ability quite often to look outside of just their own style or their own genre for inspiration. And then often they go over and they try different things throughout the course of their career. It's affected guitarists past and present. And some of the most famous players um, have this kind of genre hopping thing as part of their output. So we've invited um, two fabulous guitarists to join me and Matthew today. Um, Vin Downs and uh, Candice Mowbray have both uh, delighted. We're delighted to have you. And thanks for sharing um, your time with us this evening and also for just um, being part of our live streams and our series of chats that we have. It's just great to have such a nice community that we're building. and. Community-wise, we are looking out to yourselves out there, the viewers, the watchers. Um, last time we had some really incredible questions uh, posted. If you're watching on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, any of those platforms, you can just post a question by way of making a comment. So if you commented on the YouTube Live or you commented on Twitter or you commented on Facebook, I'll see that and I'll add it onto the screen and we will, of course, do our best to answer that question or take your comment off in a different direction. So welcome everybody. Already I can see quite a lot of people have logged on and are watching and I'm sure more will join us um, over the next hour or so. So um, I'm going to hand over to Matthew uh, to do a sort of more formal introduction and get us going on. Well, uh, both Candice and Vin, you have absolutely made careers out of moving freely from one genre to another. Uh, and Candice, you originally intended to be a jazz guitarist, as I understand it. Uh, you studied classical guitar during college, and of course you are a highly accomplished classical player. Uh, but you're equally active in music theater, pops concerts with orchestras where you're playing electric guitar, etc. Uh, you played in a band uh, during grad school, uh, as I understand it. So was and is all of this activity a... Um, a cultivated attempt on your part to crisscross stylistic barriers, or do you just intuitively uh, seek out variety in uh, in your artistic activities? It's definitely the latter, um, mixed with just the uh, my upbringing. I was uh, when I came into guitar, I spent time around professional gigging musicians, and that was the deal: was that you the call comes for the job and you just say yes and then you figure it out later and i was much braver in those days you know, <laughs> as an eight, you know 18 sometimes too brave so um you know in those days of gigging early 20s that you you'd go and play a wedding you play flute and guitar duets for the ceremony and you'd pack that up and you'd go play in a jazz combo for the cocktail hour and I usually didn't do the variety band thing, you know, that did the, the long haul afterwards, but that type of thing. But then me as a person, um, I got into guitar because of rock music and, um, you know, it was 80s hair band days and then uh, quickly um, into grunge era and then punk music. And um, I mean, that if at any given time, that's what I'm listening to. And then jazz came with that and I was around jazz musicians and I was never a great, I am not a great jazz musician, but I like playing it and I, um, you know, do my best. And for years I continued that, that trail, but then classical guitar actually came about because I went to college and you had to play classical to major in guitar. And um, it became really easy for me to practice because I worked a job and, um, there's just some dynamic stuff, you know, when you're a commuting student and trying to hang out with other people and have people as serious as you to play in a band with or to play in combos with, um, it was just easier to facilitate practicing and being serious as a solo player on classical guitar. Yeah. But the, the interest never left. I've played electric guitar this whole time, you know, and um, but the, my career has primarily publicly been playing classical guitar and chamber music, especially. 
I was going to ask there. Sorry, can I jump in, Matt? You don't mind? It's Absolutely. Just, did you feel when you got to, like, we, we would hear, I, I always mix up in America when you're at school or you're at college or at university or whatever, all the systems, I'm always, so when I went to what was called academy, it was like your secondary education after high school, right? And so it was just like your serious degree in music. And I think it was almost a time where I was like, well, I better put the electric guitar away now. <laughs> like, you know, like, were you made to feel like you needed to like sort of, not tell him about that. <laughs> no way. My undergrad, my teacher, Jerry Kunkel, was a professional jazz musician. He was the kind of guy who would be playing music theater, or, you know, at the Kennedy Center or those kind. I live um, an hour west of DC. So that's those. He was really a role model of what we all aspired to is that being able to play anything at any time. It wasn't until I went for my master's degree that I really put electric guitar on the back seat. I was still playing in a band and I was playing funk and, and, and jazz and, and stuff in this band and it would mess up my nails. Mm. And I had recitals and things. And I thought, you know, I really, and I was working and teaching. And I was like, yeah, I really just don't have time. If I want to get great at classical guitar, not just adequate um, and really start giving concerts, it just took over um, in a very natural way. Yeah. I was compelled by something that you said, uh, which is that anytime a gig comes in, no matter what the gig, <laughs> the ethos that you're coming from, and I, I was kind of raised in this too, you say yes to the gig, regardless of whether you actually can do the thing or not. Uh, did you find that to be uh, uh, true in, in, in your own case, or do you continue to find that to be true? Well, I remember one specific thing that comes to mind, and please give me the room here of youthful ignorance, okay? But our library was having a gala fundraiser, and I live in a small city. Um, so when I say willing to do anything, it was with a safety net. You know, it wasn't like the Kennedy Center called and said, hey, can you, do you specialize in Brazilian choro? And I said, yes, you know, it wasn't that kind of thing. But the local library was having a gala and said, oh, you know, we know we, you have this jazz group. Can you come play? But we really need you to play all bossa nova. You know, it's that kind of thing. And, you know, and so you go through the real book, learning every bossa nova, you know, because it had a theme to it. So that's what I mean about being willing to say yes. Sure. It wasn't sure. being willing to, you know, Bucky Pizzarelli didn't come to town and need a rhythm guitar player. And I said, yes, it wasn't that kind of thing, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, no matter what, any, any anybody who does, you know, uh, uh, go about it is going to find themselves coming up short at 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 some point. And but you're there, you've got the gig, and you and you're doing it. And so usually it makes you a better uh, a oh, version yeah. of whatever kind of player you are. Uh, similar question for you, uh, Vin. You know, you you are a classically trained guitarist, uh, but after college, you got into roots music, or maybe you were already into roots music. Uh, and uh, we know you're very much inspired by uh, guys like John Fahey, Mississippi John Hurt. Uh, one of my favorites is the Reverend Gary Davis. <laughs> Uh, and then at the same time, you're very affected by that thing that was happening uh, in the Wyndham Hill roster mm -hmm. in the 1980s with players like uh, Michael Hedges and Will Ackerman, uh, I'd right. say Alex Degrassi, you know. So how do all these influences affect your artistic activities these days? Well, I think I had started when I was in high school, like, and younger than high school playing electric guitar much like candace and playing heavy metal i mean that was my thing like loud and fast music <laughs> uh that's where i started but even when i was playing heavy metal music i always had this attraction to like the slower side of things um like uh, randy rhodes was the guitar player that really influenced me when i was young to start playing and and he was a guy who studied classical music and he played a lot of classical guitar so on one of, I think on blizzard of oz there's this short little classical solo called d and like that spoke to me and even like songs like goodbye to romance or diary of a madman were all acoustic or like diary of a madman is you know that riff is basically taken from one of the brower studies i'm not sure i forget what number it is but um Thanks. so yeah <laughs> so the slower tunes always affected me even when i was into heavy metal so while i was still in high school i did discover windham hill and i think I, matthew and i had spoke about this once i read an article a it was an interview with Michael Hedges and Michael referred to his music as heavy mental. 
And I was thinking, oh, well, heavy metal, heavy mental, that's a good segue. I should listen to this stuff. And I bought a couple of Wyndham Hill records and something about that music just, it, it rewired my brain. And I, you know, I put the electric guitar down and picked up an acoustic and started playing fingerstyle. Uh, that's where I started. And then at the end of high school thinking I'd like to continue and go to college to study music because I was, you know, dabbling with fingerstyle guitar. It was either classical or jazz. And so I went into classical and and spent time in, in school studying that and getting an education degree as well. And by the end of college, I knew I wasn't going to be a classical concert player. I mean, it, I wasn't good enough for that. I did love it. I studied composition. I did a lot of ensemble stuff, but I knew that that wasn't what I was going to be doing. Um, and then after college, I hooked up with John Sheehan, who's a teacher in North Jersey here, and he was a roots music guy. And he was smart because when I first started studying with him, he turned me on to like Chance and Renborn. And like, you know, Renborn was doing a lot of the um, Renaissance type stuff on steel string guitars. And so that was a good segue for me. And then he kind of hit me with the Mississippi John Hurt and the Blind Blake and Reverend Gary Davis and Fahey and all that stuff. So I was always going in this sort of circle of like influence where, you know, it's like, okay, classical. Now I want to learn jazz. Now I want to play blues. Now I want to do this. And I, I was in that circle for a long time and I felt like I was never really getting really good at anything. I was just dabbling in stuff. And eventually I, you know, it was, I guess I was in my thirties where I was, I was still writing. I was always writing music, but I wanted to, you know, find a path and I had to use all of those influences to sort of find my own voice. And I guess that was the goal to take everything that I've studied or dabbled in and somewhere in there, find my own voice and, and my own way of, you know, communicating all that stuff, all those influences. And, mm. you know, and I think it's a mix of everything, but all those played into what I do now, I think. So it's it nice. was all... Sorry, just jumping in, Vin, but it, yeah. it's nice hearing you like talk about how it's been a very positive influence and all of these things are sort of in a melting pot that then mm -hmm. come out in the way you, you, you play and, and, and you think about music and I guess you compose as well, but, I'm thinking it's it's interesting. When I was studying classical guitar, it was very much classical guitar, and it was almost like it was almost the opposite of something that um, I think both you and Candice have, have sort of hit on, which is you want to learn a style, or someone says to you it's bossa nova night, and you have to learn about you know an hour of bossa nova music or whatever. Or you're like, okay, I'd, I would like to really get into jazz. I would like to 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 sort of do it. In classical, I think there's often a thing where it's like, I'd like to add a piece to my repertoire. And it's like, you're you're working on a piece that's really kind of massive. And that mm -hmm. takes so long to just get that piece into like the concert level sort of repertoire. And I kind of think sometimes like we don't have that, or certainly I didn't when I was sort of in my education, didn't get allowed to sort of maybe experiment with trying something. It was always like, it has to be ready for something, you know, mm -hmm. so it has to be, like fit for a purpose at the end of it, which was quite um, quite limiting in terms of just having that wanderlust where you're like, oh, I'll try a bit of this, oh, I'll try a bit of that, I'll see what happens to me if I play a little bit of this for the week, you know that it is. But mm -hmm. it's nice to it's nice to sort of hear you, about you just sort of like almost wanting not to leave any style with some you having some experience of it. Yeah, yeah, and at the same time, I, I realized in many of the styles, like I I would always would have loved to have been a jazz player, like just to play like bebop. Yeah. And I, I, there was, I can't endless times I would go back to and take out my Jamie Ambersall books and listen and transcribe. And this time I'm going to do it. It, it's just, it just wasn't meant to be, you know, I love jazz, but I'm never going to be a jazz guitar player. Mm -hmm. And going through all those different styles, I had to be really honest with myself and say like, well, I, you know, if I'm just playing this in the house for myself, that's great, but I can never do this in front of people. So I got to find something that I could really be good at and feel comfortable comfortable at and you know where i could say something with the music and even with classical stuff studying classical i never felt like i had the command to communicate with what the piece was trying to say i just didn't feel i had that command of the instrument so i wanted to find my way you know and that was with my music where i could actually really communicate what i wanted to say with the music you know technically but also emotionally so but all of those influences all those different styles i think go into that for me yeah, well, there's a question. Point. The question just come in for you, particularly then, which is from Adam P. You've kind of answered, I guess, the first part of it because you talk, mm -hmm. talk about switching from metal to classical. But he also says, like, just a simple question: Which artist influences you most today? Yeah, and those are, you know, I think I know who that is who asked that question. He knows that that's a hard question for me to answer because 
I, I find myself not listening to guitar players a lot anymore um, or as, as much, you know, I, I really, now I listen to a lot more, you know, singers, songwriters or piano players, you know, looking for different ideas of harmony and rhythm and a different way of accompanying things and, you know, paying attention to how singers phrase things, uh, not so much guitar players, but the um, one comes to mind, uh, a guitarist in Boston, uh, Lyle Brewer, uh, I think he teaches at Berkeley. He's a guy who can do everything and he's got to be one of the cleanest guys on the planet. I mean, whatever he's playing, it's jazz or, or rock. He's got a, a rock band neighbor. I think his name of the rock band, but he writes some beautiful finger style music and he's so effortless and so clean, but yet so emotional and so full of feeling when he plays. I think he's, he's one of my favorites that I've come across in the last five years or so, but there, there's so many, it's there's so many people to listen to. Nowadays, What's interesting right? comes it's interesting you mentioned the fingerstyle. If you would um for if you would allow me to play a little clip, I think it's time to sort of hear from a great of the guitar. Not that you all aren't greats of the guitar, um, but I think it's uh, I've got a few different people to highlight throughout you know our chat tonight, and I'm going to start with one of the fingerstyle greats, Chet Atkins, who you know is just a name that sort of if you if you don't know who Chet Atkins is, you need to go and find out who Chet Atkins is right now. And we're talking primetime American TV here, you know, uh, you know, becoming part of the sort of cultural landscape. Um, and that translated across the Atlantic as well. Um, and I've got a beautiful clip of him playing here. And he's playing classical guitar, actually. He's sitting with a classical guitar and he's playing a Scott Joplin arrangement. And it's absolutely beautiful. And I'm sure many of you watching will, have, will, will know this video. So we're only going to play, a, you know, a few seconds of it just to give a flavor of it. But it's I want when I'm I'm interested in how you react to this, um, all of you, you know, watching and and, and commenting as well, and also that I've got a few thoughts about it myself, which would be great to share with you. I mean, I mean, just how how it provoked me to think about like thinking about music slightly differently. So let's have a listen to to Chet Atkins. You can find that on YouTube. You know, you can find the whole the whole performance, which is just stellar. I'm sure you've probably seen that before, right? I mean, dude, you're going in. You're going into my my big influence. There It was Mark Knopfler to Chet Atkins nice, to nice. to classical music. You know, uh, <laughs> uh, so so there's there's no way of preaching to the choir more than uh, more than Chet playing the entertainer on what must have been like the Tonight Show or something. Yeah, do you know what yeah. that was? Is that is that what it was or something like I that? Did, I'm not sure because the clip that I managed to find didn't didn't have like the interview bit with him before. Okay. So it just literally was someone who obviously loved it so much that he just gone to the music. Yeah, uh, but isn't it funny watching that because the thing that doesn't necessarily, I think it's amazing because it's obviously like it's obviously like a, a tonight show, like you say, that sort of thing, that level of like public, um, you know, sort of viewership, but it's the way he plays it. It's the phrasing. It's like, he has this really like, I'm sh I, I don't know, obviously, but it seems to me like he is taking the, he is deciding the time, the rebattle right there and then, like he is deciding to slow down to the end of those phrases because he knows his audience and he knows he's playing it in a different way and he's reaching people in a different way. The, he, he's, he's doing something that like in a a classical masterclass you would get shot for, <laughs> you know, you would, get, you would get told like, get out. That's absolutely shocking. But like, he's, he's kind of asking a question with the phrasing almost. It's like, do you want to come with me? This is a bit out of everyone's, you know, expectation of what I do, but like, here we go. And the sound, like he's got left hand color going on. He's got, it's just amazing. Like I just, I staggered watching that. I think most people would just go trucking right through that. Right. But he just gives so much importance to every single note in there. And you almost sense like, okay, well it's going to pick up here. Oh, wait, no. Now he, Oh no. He just takes his, that's a beautiful version of that. Yeah. It's my one favorite. Of my, one of my hobbies is, um, going through bookstores and 
old bookstores and finding things and actually bought um, the old publication, the check goes to the movies, it's the transcriptions and all of that. And it's all in standard notation. And what I wanted to share was that I grew up uh, with Hee Hall. And uh, so Chet Atkins, Jerry Reed is one of my absolute favorites. Um, Roy Clark, remember Roy Clark on The Odd Couple playing Malaganya. <laughs> and so for me, there was this interesting thing that happened as I got better at classical guitar and kind of went back in, in a nostalgia sense, listening and watching some clips from Hee Hall. And, and I'm a, this is kind of hard to describe it. Um, like I'm a huge Brian Setzer fan. And so mm -hmm. going through rockabilly and the, kind of just working backwards into these various country players and, and stuff, Vince Gill, you know, watching videos of Vince Gill, not his like pop song stuff, but just his guitar playing and yeah. and um, remembering the stuff actually from childhood when it was just entertainment, but actually, you know, going down the rabbit hole of that. And there's a great video of Dolly Parton in the studio with Chet Atkins. And um, so it got me thinking about um, this phrase that comes to mind when guitar was just guitar. You know, and this has always been something that has been a part, like, I was going back and I remember recording my first CD, and by all stretch of, you know, understanding, it's a classical guitar CD, but at the time of recording it, my intention was really, like, I didn't want to call myself a classical guitar, so I want, it's solo guitar, I just wanted to share solo guitar music with people, and that's something I've struggled through with, through all these years was mm. I often would say, am I a classical guitar player? Like I know I'm playing, but even the repertoire I choose and, you know, listening to, to Chet Atkins just now, I wouldn't even second think his phrasing. Like it's, to me, it's the most beautiful thing I've heard today and, uh, or, you know, in a while. And, and, uh, and I wouldn't even think there was something unusual about it. And so I actually have a really hard time when I'm confronted with, the idea, I don't know how to say this, but the idea that there's some rule, oh, that's not proper. You know, like I can't do it anymore. That, that's, that, that was that is kind of what I was, um, <laughs> when, you, when you were like talking about going to college and stuff and I was thinking, God, I had the exact opposite experience. Like, not that like I had teachers at college that didn't like rock and pop and jazz and stuff like that, but it just wasn't, it just kind of like, it felt like it wasn't proper. And I think there's a UK classical music snobbery, which, which kills me. Like, you know, and I, I feel like guitar, for a long time has like tried to sort of make itself feel as serious and as accepted as in the hallows of like a Royal Academy of Music or where I went, Royal Scottish Academy of Music, where like the piano players are playing Tchaikovsky and Beethoven and Brahms and the guitar players are like trying to, you know, we are genre hopping, even even classical, we're, we're stealing a bit of Baroque music, a bit of Renaissance music, a bit of Spanish stuff, we're, we're all over the place with it. And it was never, about celebrating the strength of that and the the norm like normalizing that that's just that's just how we appreciate music like I love your reaction Candice which is like I, could, I can't get my head around that it just sounds amazing like you know and I'm I'm, I'm totally with you I mean, we were having a conversation before before we went live ladies and gentlemen we were having a conversation about movies and we were talking about like why don't we just do a conversation about movies because yesterday my partner and I we went to see Tar which is the, the, about this uh, fictional conductor, Lydia Tarr. And I, I, I was not a big fan of this movie at all, but I can see the classical music world not saying a bad word about it because they're desperate for like something cool and something really, really fancy and flash and hip and trendy. And they're just, I mean, all the reviews will be like mega positive in the classical music world because, oh my God, Kate Blanchett cares about classical music. You know, that kind of vibe, which just, it kills me. I find it tragic. I find it like missing missing the beauty of something like we just watched by by Chet, which is just like I know I know it's a rag time. It's not like he's not playing Mozart or something like that. But it's just it's outside of the expectation for 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 what my education sort of taught me to believe, if that makes sense. It's like when you talked about having to rewrite or reset something, that's kind of sometimes how I feel when I sort of really get excited about a performance or a play and I think should I? Like, you know, it's almost like, am I allowed to like this? It's terrible. <laughs> well, you know, it's, I, I, I was kind of thinking, Mike, Michael's got a good comment and, and I want to get to that in a second, but um, uh, I, I, I would like to, to mention two, two kind of disparate thoughts. One about Chet and, 
the the fact that Chet was in the room when Elvis was recording. Chet's day job, let's not forget, was not necessarily as a touring guitar player. He was a recording engineer. Um, and uh, I mean, he was he was like the intrepid Nashville guy. And he recorded everybody. You mentioned Dolly Parton. We're also talking about like, you know, uh, uh, you know, early sort of pop slash uh, country uh, musicians. Uh, uh, he broke Willie Nelson. Um, it, it, you know, Chet, Chet's really like the ultimate genre hopper uh, of uh, of of that scene. And then the other thing, um, which which I I, I think it, 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 at least um, uh, Vin and, and, and Candace, you might be able to speak to, which is I kind of wonder about the lack of infrastructure when it comes to guitar education, we're kind of losing it in the States now. We're kind of uh, 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 generating a bunch of, of in infrastructure, which can be a good thing, it can be a bad thing. But I think the, at least the three of us came up in a very sort of loosey-goosey, you do your own thing, and then eventually you might sort of find yourself in the environment of classical music education or you know serious jazz education in, in in college but it was man it was a free for all at least in my uh experience until i got kind of routed uh into the sort of conservatory system at the age of 18 uh is that was that true for you too or or is this just my own um i don't know experience candace you can go first um, you know, it's, uh, it's neat to hear you say that because I wondered if it was a regional thing for me, mm. but, um, I was lucky to have four years, uh, of music theory class in high school. Yeah. Wow. And, um, we had jazz band and, um, there was group guitar class and, uh, but, uh, yeah, it was pretty much free, like that you studied guitar privately, you found a teacher, you know, and very much around where I live. My experience was um, primarily that that was rock music. Mm -hmm. um, however, this is really bizarre. When I first started playing guitar at age 13, it was electric guitar. And I didn't own a classical guitar until I was 20. Um, and so at age 13, I got to have just a couple of guitar lessons. We didn't have a lot of money growing up and but my granddad got me a couple of guitar lessons at a local music store and the first thing that the teacher ever wrote out or tabbed out for me were uh, excerpts from Bach conventions <laughs> like yeah it was the strangest thing it wasn't even because I went in my grandma had taught me some chords you know GCD and that kind of thing and uh I kind of wish I had saved those books because I just in retrospect that's pretty funny but yeah, so it was a mixed bag, just to agree with you. And then when I decided I was going to study music in college rather than accounting, um, I needed to play classical guitar for the auditions. And my boyfriend, now husband, got me a classical guitar and um, and I put together, I think, Hey Sue, Joy of Man's Desiring or something on my own. And, and I went to a liberal arts undergrad. So and we were encouraged to play jazz and classical in that program. And wow. then it was, I went to conservatory for master's and doctoral work where you, I just played classical. Mm -hmm. How about, How about you? you? <laughs> um, well, same kind of thing. I mean, when I was in high school, I was lucky to have, um, I did two years of theory because we did have theory classes and um, I joined the jazz band, I think my junior year because they needed a, somebody to play the bass on something. So I mean, my friend who was a drummer in jazz band said, well, you should join because I already knew how to read music because I had been taking guitar lessons. Um, but when I had joined jazz band, you know, I had great teachers in high school, Dave Watson, Bob Dokus, and Dennis Argel. The three of those guys were fantastic. Uh, great teachers, but they were really good at, you know, the, the students that were really interested in music, they were really, really good at um, making us curious on our own to go out and mm -hmm. find other things and to pursue other 
um, listen to other types of music and maybe learn how to, you know, play other types of music. They would take us to concerts, different kinds of genres of music. They, that was really important. They really sort of planted a seed in us that, you know, I could show you 50% of what you're going to learn might come from me, the teacher. The other 50% has to come from you, the student. You have to be excited and curious and get out there and do a lot of that on your own. So that really helped me um, make the decision to go, go to college. And I wanted to teach as well because those teachers were so good that, you know, Dave Watson, who was my band director, when I had him in high school, he had just come off the road with the police. He's a saxophone player. So he did the world, the synchronicity world tour. So here was this guy in the classroom who was a fantastic educator, um, but he would, you know, he was a real musician. He had just come off the road and he had all these stories about, you know, traveling the world and, and playing live. So he was bringing that to the classroom and that got us really excited because he wasn't just telling us what to do. He was showing us what to do through his own examples. You know, um, I teach in the same high school that I graduated from. And, and now I teach, this is the 10th or 11th year that I've been doing a classical guitar program at the school. So, you know, we have a good music program. Um, but like the kids that I get 90% of them have never touched a guitar in their life before they take it. Cause it just sounds like it's a cool elective. Um, I don't have any kids coming to me saying, I want to learn how to play classical guitar, <laughs> but I run it as a classical ensemble. They teach, you know, I teach them classical technique and they learn how to read music and we play ensemble music. That's primarily classical stuff or, you know, classical arrangements of maybe pop tunes, Beatle tunes or whatever. And the goal is just to, you know, that's the avenue we're going to learn how to play the instrument but you're going to learn the tools to play whatever style of music you want to learn. You can apply it wherever you like, whether you listen to Taylor Swift or Slayer or whatever, you'll be able to play. And the goal of that is the same thing that my teachers did to me. I want to kind of spark the interest in them that, okay, I'm going to give you some of the tools you need to, to do this, but you want to, you know, you have to be curious on your own and go out and, and look for things and, and listen to other things and experience other things. Yeah. So, and it's, it's essential about, it's essential. You say like good teachers, won't shut down that curiosity, you know, um, yeah. because I mean, I just want to talk about this uh, sort of question comment that's come in. And there's actually two from Michael, um, Michael Nevereski here. And I just I shout it to Michael as well. Michael's a patron of the Gallery of Guitar. And it's so good to have um, the patrons supporting the gallery and also asking such amazing questions. He's just as said, as guitar players, we have a place in nearly all genres of Western music. It's both a, a blessing and a challenge, which obviously um, is, and that's kind of what we're talking about really, or we've, we've already started discussing. But then he goes on to say the biggest of the challenges is finding the time to become fluent in more than one of these musical languages. And it's funny, um, people are, people are, there's a lot of more comments coming in, which I'll get to, but people are also, um, you know, because they've got my number, you know who you are, you know who you are. Uh, <laughs> They're messaging me as well, and I've asked if it's okay if I sort of paraphrase a little bit a message that I just got in from a from a, a, a previous student, um, so someone who is is it, it, this is quite I think um, what would the word for, for for it be? It's 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 very important to because they're they're a fairly recent graduate, and they're sort of saying there's there's lots of different things. But one of the things that I thought was so good was maybe people. This is the person says maybe uh, people in such good positions as you four, as in us, um, could encourage students to take more time and experiment, listen, and dare I say, um, be free. And the, the, the points that this uh, the person reaching out on sort of text message makes is just there's so much diversity and influences. That's what makes guitar so great. It's such an approachable instrument. And maybe sometimes that's lost when we're studying. And he, he sort of also agrees with kind of me, which was an experience I had many years before for this student, which was um, sort of put the electric guitar away at the moment. You know, we're not going to be sort of doing that. And what Michael's comment says is, you know, finding time to become fluent in more than one of these musical languages. Well, I would say that as a classical guitar player, I'm going to spend my lifetime trying to become fluent in just that one instrument. And I don't think really it's probably, I mean, levels of fluency, there's echelons of everything. Like, I don't know what my level of fluency will be in let's say classical guitar by the time I get to an age where I think I've done enough with it or whatever. But there's definitely for me, it's not necessarily about trying to become, let's say, more more fluent in different languages. It's just the experiencing them, like that message from that student, the experimentation, the time, being afforded that time in an educational environment. Even if it doesn't necessarily come to anything, it's not about that. It's about having had that experience and that time and being allowed and afforded it, which I think is a really 
it's a really interesting sort of point that education doesn't it doesn't really support at the moment. Education is more about an end product all the time, you know, um, and that idea of just living with something for a while, that's maybe something that we, us four, that we, we were called out there beautifully. Um, so there you go, you know. What do you think? Um, Stunned silence. Well, I have three very separate thoughts. One yeah. is uh, a question for everybody, which is, um, so like I said, I didn't play classical guitar until I was 20, but I did have a lot of music training. Um, in fact, I had played clarinet and oboe since I was in fifth grade. So the reading music thing and being an orchestra and that kind of stuff. But largely in my teaching, um, I've taught in colleges for about 20 years. Uh, and I largely students would come in without classical guitar experience or even any music reading experience on the guitar um, and or really any experience outside of playing by ear rock music and funk and um, whatever their their popular interest was so there's this period of catch-up that really um, can be difficult to then have room for experimentation and finding a voice with it so that's kind of a question comment if that's been other people's experiences Mm -hmm. um, and then the idea of being fluent in various styles, that's why I'm always really quick when I mention playing jazz, where I, it always comes with this, but I'm not very good at it, you know, like, because a lot of my friends aren't great jazz musicians. Um, to that end, just, it was really nice to hear you say, Matthew, about experiencing those kind of things. So, you know, it's not that I anticipate being a great, jazz player by the, my end of days mm -hmm. but i'm not gonna not do it you yeah. know you know and um but then the third kind of unrelated comment i wanted to share with that is um the issue of everything being recorded and so i came up in an era where you could go out and do a jazz gig and not be that great at it and that was part of the experimentation process and learning and i've heard stand-up comedians talk about this that you have a joke and it takes time to work it out on stage to get the right language and to experiment in front of an audience. And so that's something that coming through a period of so many things being recorded and, and saved for, you know, some indefinite amount of time. I was wondering if anybody feels a lack of desire to try things because of that. Yes. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I would say that, uh, I mean, in, in, in my experience, squaring uh, influences and squaring, um, you know, like sort of dipping my toe into the water of jazz harmonies or even of other types of, of, of musical exploration, like, like uh, composition, um, all of that, I think, has been a... a uh, an, an act of, of uh, giving myself permission almost. And that, that permission doesn't always come from outside. And, and, and usually, in fact, I kind of feel like there's, there's a, a lack of permission um, that, that is uh, available in a traditional uh, music education, certainly a conservatory based uh, music education. And so it was after that experience that I felt like I could give myself the permission to, 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 to make those types of, of explorations. And that's been kind of the fun stuff, actually. Do you think, though, that because I, 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 my brain's going 19 to the dozen here, it's going very sort of fast through this, because I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, like Carter's point there, do you guys feel the, how do you guys feel about the idea? Um, but even light exploration of varying styles can improve and expand one's classical playing. And that's what I was just sort of saying. We wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily have any idea how it's going to permeate into it, but even just the experience of it is something that I think should be should be championed and should should be afforded the time. But then we, we see that video of someone like Chet Atkins playing, and definitely it, it, he he's have, has absolutely no problem playing in that style. 
Um, and, and then he also does something else with that style that I didn't think was as obvious if I was attempting that sort of Joplin rag. And it makes me want to play, I, I had my clips in sort of order, so I'm going to go completely off piste here because that's what this is conversations provoking me to do. Um, and um, play a, a hilarious clip. I mean, I find it hilarious. Um, I would be very interested to see what you think. And it's, it's John Williams and his prog rock band Sky. And... Um, Let's just let's just have a listen and then see see where we are after this. Amazing stuff, just amazing. Whew. That, that was, <laughs> what do you think, that, was an, that was an eye fall. <laughs> <laughs> I was listening to that. I, I saw Matthew had in his post on Facebook today mentioned that we were going to be talking about Sky, and I thought to myself, "Oh my God, I haven't even thought of that band, you know, for so long." And then I was I listened to the first record today while I was grocery shopping, and I'm like, yeah. "Okay, this is kind of like a light version of Yes." But mm -hmm. also sounds mm -hmm. like if Andrew Lloyd Webber had a rock band in some yeah. weird, twisted way. I like, I, you know, I I can get on board with it. It's but the clothes. You're right. That's you know, that's it's just awesome. amazing. It's amazing. the drummer dressed up for the video too. That's the, tr great. the drummer Tristan Fry. I mean, what, very what, unfortunate aspect ratio that they were doing <laughs> at the time. You know, like that's that's. I think it's cruel, really. Let's come back. I like our slightly wider. Um, Matthew, yeah. that that's come back that look that's like your that, that's right there that tristan fry you know drummer of sky didn't mean that one to rhyme but that's right there now like you know and i mean how many toms and symbols do you need to be honest like you know i, mean, well, he, I believe he answers that question without I, without yeah, oh, without, yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. All the more time. i believe is the answer. <laughs> yeah. and also I there's get john williams hair though i mean two thumbs yeah. up right there no it's amazing yeah yeah yep. and also the guy playing harpsichord who's ah oh, is it frank Oh fr no, Francis! I think France. I uh, can't remember Francis. Francis Monkman is the keyboard player. He was like a virtuoso organ and harpsichord player, and I think like they met at the Royal Academy in London. But he just looks like Matt Berry, who's like a, a a modern day comic, and like he's sitting at the harpsichord and just gives like the camera this absolute like I'm doing this, and it's happening. <laughs> And it's just, he just reminds me of this guy, Matt Berry, so much. You've got to check this guy out. But. I love Matt Berry. I almost wore my Can You Hear Me, Clem Fandango t shirt tonight. So I just. <laughs> Clem Fandango. Love it. Love it. Um, but there you go. I mean, there's there's somebody like Williams who, like, nobody. It's in a way like, does, uh, in part of Williams's educational sort of history, who would have seen that coming? You know, yeah. you would not have expected that for a second. Yeah, yeah, I th and and he kind of, uh, I mean, we t we talked about this a little bit in the in the last conversation that we were having about Bremen Williams, but I mean, like, I I think John Williams really, you know, kind of made a portion of his career about that sort of like hard left turn, you know, um, kind of zigging when the audience expects you to to zag, and I think that has just absolutely made his career utterly fascinating sometimes yeah. sometimes they're really successful explorations and sometimes they look they, they look a little forced to me sky has, is always a little bit uh gimmicky um and uh you know and it's fun but you sort of have to like give yourself over to it as a listener um and uh so I don't know. To to me, I always have to kind of like in the back of my head, I just sort of have to flip that switch. Um, like personally as a listener, where I'm like, nope, I'm just this, this is just just go with it. Like, don't, don't overthink it. Just, you know, it is what it is, you know. 
it's a special musical moment, Matthew. That's oh, what it was. And, it, okay, in time, time. very good. Time. <laughs> in all the and in fashion. Amazing, amazing. You can't beat it. It's also really square at times as well. Like, you know, rhythmically, mm -hmm. like it's incredibly square. And you're like, there's nothing swinging about this. So there's nothing even just slightly loose about it. It's like, we're going to do it, but we're going to do it really well and really in time. <laughs> you're like, okay, fine. <laughs> Very polite rock music. Like, you know, it's just so strange. But I just, yeah, I just, I, it strikes me as like, could could someone do that now? Because you're, you're saying like it's gimmicky and, and, and I get, I, I agree with you on one level. But then I also think that nowadays students kind of think like, okay, it's important to do classical and electric. It's impossible. It's it's important to like have this kind of idea where like, oh, and I'm also going to do this now as well. And to the modern day sort of like, let's say classical promoter, that that shows that it's really cool. Like, you know, and it might reach a sort of younger audience and stuff like that. And I almost find that more gimmicky than Sky. Like I feel like Sky probably happened because all these these people were hanging about and they also liked doing this stuff and they were like, well, we can do this. Can we just have a band and like have fun? We're not, mm. we're not cool. We're not like, yes, we're not like queen. We don't, you know, but we just want to do it. And they just did it rather than like, I don't think they were, I don't think they were taking it that seriously in a way they were doing it for themselves. And it just happened to be a weird moment in the zeitgeist where they got a record deal for it, you know, cause it's so strange, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I. I mean, I'm a. I, obviously, it's it's within my own self interest to be uh, very much pro uh, uh, use of of electric guitars. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and for for me personally, I'd, I'd be really interested to know what, what you think, Candice, because we've we've had a couple of conversations about this before this conversation. Um, but I, I feel like the repertoire has kind of moved modern guitarists in the direction of also using electric guitars and electronics. And uh, I, I feel like it's it's just kind of more part of the zeitgeist at this moment, because mm -hmm. as a guitar player, we have this repertoire that's a, that, that's available to us. For me, that's felt a little bit natural, but uh, well, I don't know, maybe it is a gimmick. That's okay, I guess. Yeah. Uh, well, now, Candace, you, you play a lot of electric guitar. Um, and you were kind enough to 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 play a piece of mine, which is uh, uh, I I appreciate more than I can ever say. Um, and <laughs> and so, how did that? How does that kind of come into your concert? Um, like your your concerts when you're programming that stuff? What is your thinking behind uh, uh, adding solo classical guitar or excuse me, solo electric guitar music? So there was an evolution that I'll share. I just wanted to make one comment um, based on the video. Uh, I don't know what year that was, but um, it brought to mind that, you know, there was this period, I guess, in the, I'm assuming it was the early 70s, but I could be wrong there, of classical guitar being in rock music. And I remember, like, I really like Rod Stewart. And I remember this particular video where there's that classical intro to Maggie May. And actually seeing a you know like yeah. a top of the pops or American bandstand with the classical guitar player there sitting on a step and mm -hmm. uh, playing the intro, it was really interesting because he looks completely introverted. Like he's sitting there, and he, I don't even think he ever looks up. You know, like people are dancing and bumping into him, and he's just sitting there playing. So if you can find that, it's worth worth the the couple minutes to search. Definitely. And, um, and classical gas, like I don't know when that came out and. But I used to have gigs playing in restaurants when I was young, and people would mention these things that, you know, mm -hmm. I played the first gymnopathy, gym, Gymnopédie by Sati, and people would, non-classical music people would always say, hey, wasn't that in this movie? Or So um, I wonder if this this album with John Williams coming out, you know, if it was just a natural part of, of the music scene at that time, in a way. It seemed um, more predisposed to that happening. Do you know what I mean? Like, I just, I feel like the landscape was allowing that rather than sort of shutting that down. They were like late seventies. I think they started in like seventy eight, and they went all the way through to like nineteen ninety five or something like that. Like, that people left and went on to do different things. But like, there's quite a few albums. It's, Interesting. it's an experience. <laughs> but um, Matthew, your uh, piece, um, I was thrilled to like make friends with you on Instagram and see the stuff that you were posting. Um, 
so after you know that funk band I was describing when I was in grad school, I really did, uh, except for music theater and an occasional pops concert, I really did largely put electric guitar down. Mm. And um, classical guitar was focused on really um, playing concerts and um, exploring, you know, what does it mean? And can I be a classical guitar concert artist, you know, and uh, also playing a ton of chamber music. Um, but then during the pandemic, uh, my husband, who is a very well-rounded guitar player, um, he and I got asked to record a Duke Ellington piece for this project that was combining um, musicians with filmmakers. And, and the person reached out to me uh, solely uh, and had recommended, knowing I was a classical musician, largely it was jazz musicians involved in this project, and he had recommended that I record this piece, African Flower. And um, so I saw this version of Duke Ellington playing this piece, solo piano, on a late night television show, or, or just a TV show from the 60s. And it sounded like Debussy. Um, I mean, it was just the, the most entrancing, beautiful performance. And um, we were locked in, and I asked my husband uh, to transcribe it. And so he transcribed it for two guitars, and we recorded it, me playing classical guitar and him playing electric guitar or steel string acoustic. I forget which he did. But we recorded it, and it was this really nice thing. And then we got asked to do some home concerts, and the two of us being here, you know, we did it together rather than either of us doing solo performances. And just prior to that, we had started doing some duets where he played electric guitar and I played classical guitar. We took the uh, a great piece by Maximo Diego Pujol and we did the three movements of it that way, where I played classical and he played electric. And then um, for various reasons that moved into us both playing electric or or various combinations of steel string, nylon string, and electric guitar. So um, then seeing your piece for solo guitar, I thought, oh, this is great. Like I, I have an electric guitar solo piece that I can play. And we started commissioning people to write both solo and guitar duets for pick style guitar. Hmm. So not just solo guitar, not just electric guitar, but specifically pick style guitar. So we just got a piece from Giorgio Merto called uh, Beyond the Curtains, which is fabulous. Um, my friend Michael DeLala, whose music, um, he is such a good composer for solo guitar and, um, and his music falls between, like a classical guitarist could program it. Um, there's this Wyndham Hill aspect to some of it. And uh, it's, it's just its own voice, his round midnight variations. I always think that I could hear on any solo classical guitar recital. Mm. But he wrote me a tribute to Anwar Brahem for solo pick style guitar that actually has an improvisatory section in it. And he wrote us a duet. And then um, another good friend, Cam Miller, wrote us a duet called Winter Dance. We recorded Icarus. Um, we're doing some you know other Ralph Towner stuff. So... The, where it comes to get to your point, how do you program that? I had not in my life tried to program solo electric guitar with classical guitar recitals. Uh -huh. What I did was I would sometimes do a split recital where I'd do half solo guitar and then the other half I'd either do in duet. Actually, we did these cool concerts where I'd do solo, then my husband and I would do duets like I described, and then his jazz group would take over the other half or the, the other portion of the concert. So it had this nice progression to it. And all of that has led into developing uh, he and I playing concerts that really are not genre specific. And um, and yeah, we play Bach duets on electric guitar, you know, and we do Renaissance duets and I just like it. And that's just what we're gonna do. So like, there you go. But your piece was a wonderful, wonderful asset that really sparked, okay, we can get people to write music for us and uh, it's going to be great and we're going to believe in it and we can use pedals and what pedals should we buy now? 
Yeah, it's a it's a thing that's in the air right now, and 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 it, I find it very very exciting. Um, and uh, the, yeah, I think it's I I think it's cool. Uh, we I I saw in the comment this this comment from Kevin is is awesome. There was another one about Sean Sheeby playing, uh, you know his 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 two releases on Pentatone. Mm -hmm. very very different you know the the first record that he did is is uh uh mostly like french 20th century uh uh transcriptions and then uh this new record that he has is all um uh electric guitar music and it's really pretty magical i'm a i'm a big fan particularly of his arrangements of hildegard uh von bingen uh, uh pieces i think they're I, I think sean does a great job uh, with that uh, melodic material, but I, I'd like to go back to this this uh, a comment by um, by Kevin. Uh, yeah, pretty pretty interesting. Where where are we coming down on 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 this? It's funny. I mean, I I can I know something. I mean, I I did teach Kevin for a while, and he studied with other teachers up here in Glasgow. Um, and he's uh, based in London now, and he's an excellent electric guitarist and classical guitarist. And there was also a point. You know, it's quite interesting to, the comments. I know they pushed the conversation in different directions, but there was also another comment which I put up before, which was from Matt Hugh, um, which was nice to pick up on different styles of guitar, even when studying at university, maybe cut back on some of the other aspects of the classical university programs. Um, so I just wanted to sort of say that, you know, that I hadn't completely not, we hadn't, you know, even addressed that point because I think we kind of address it maybe in the, in the response to Kevin, but um, this is a great point. Most students study for four years, and in the grand scheme, that is nothing. It's a life's work to cram everything into this small window. It's a lot of pressure on students. Any advice for current students? And I think this is um, this is it's a fantastic question. It's almost kind of impossible, um, or I find it impossible to give a completely succinct and clear answer to this because I think um, I think that we we maybe don't realise soon enough in the process that we're not going to get it all done in the four years like that, that's me speaking from experience is that like maybe in a way the vocational aspect of studying music has to be slightly more obvious from the educational standpoint and it's going back to me sort of suggesting that we need just more time to ruminate on these ideas and on these things when we're a student having it crammed into four years and having all the ideological and philosophical uh, philosophical changes that will happen in those four years. I mean, I don't know how you felt it, it, when you were studying, but sometimes that would be like on the Monday, I would go in with this particular idea. And on the Tuesday, that would be completely wrong. And I had now, I was off in this direction and this was the greatest thing since sliced bread. And I was there and I was going to do this now, this was it. And then next day it was like, oh, wait a minute, my eyes have been open to this now. And, and now I'm off on this one. So Maybe it's maybe the advice for for current students from my perspective teaching a lot is that of course you have to be you know assessed on things and of course there are points at which you will feel that your art form and your creativity are being put into a particular box and then put up for you know assessment and you know you're going to have to in a way bend and shape things sometimes for for the program but. Sometimes the, the the fight that I see students have is it's almost as if they feel that that will be the way it will then be forever, or in some way that will that will that will just stop. It will be stuck, and I kind of feel like well, nobody could have changed really how I felt about music when I was a student. I don't no know if they way. Can now, you know. No so way. it's like if, if I think the people that ask these questions, like Kevin and and and, and the other chap, you know, you, you're already coming from a perspective of like you you are craving the different stimulation and the different ideas you're already got that open mind and it's having that open mind it's it's having that and that curiosity that vin talked about great teachers will 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 push forward that curiosity and they will they will then give you new things to think about um but the, the i mean current advice to current students it's just i mean it's so reductive to say don't take yourself and everything so seriously but in a way if I was talking to a first year undergraduate student, I would be kind of going down that route. I would be thinking, okay, let's not take this all completely so seriously. It's not all going to be set in stone. This is just part of the journey. Like sometimes I like to get their thoughts down on paper. There's different courses that I, that I teach on that are not just guitar. And I often get to find out what they think their musical career profile will be when they graduate. 
but find that out in first year and sort of do a little a little study on what that could be and then reflect back on it and see where they've got. Have they got anywhere near that idea at the beginning or has it completely evolved into something else? So maybe from my perspective, not setting everything in stone and not taking it too seriously at the early stages. But it'd be great to hear Vin and it'd be great to hear your thoughts as well. Uh, well, I mean, four years, is that's just not enough time to really do much of anything, is it? I mean, I'm still trying to figure out like you just said, it's like, well, next week I might want to do something completely different than I'm into this week, right? Like for myself personally, I, I came out with the education degree and I, I didn't think I was going to teach. But once I was done with college, I was still, I didn't know where I was musically yet. I mean, I had studied for four years or whatever, and uh, I knew I wasn't going to perform classically. I was into composition at that point, and, but I didn't know what I was going to do musically. I had no idea, even after four years. So I didn't think I was going to teach, but after a year out of school, I did go into teaching and I was still trying to figure out what did I want to do, what I wanted to do musically. Um, and that didn't happen until, you know, I didn't, my current path, I didn't pick until I was, you know, start writing and recording. So I was like 36 years old. So it, it was years of that, you know, circle of influence, this, that, the other thing. So I, you know, it, it's tough with students because I remember school was always like, and it is now because I'm teaching it's, it. It feels like it's always like, okay, here's the next performance work, 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 perform. Here's the new music, work, 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 perform. And it always felt like that. And that in between, I remember, exactly in, I feel <laughs> right. And I remember in college, I went to William Patterson and the jazz department of William Patterson is, is renowned. And, and there were amazing players there. And me and my classical guitar friends who wanted to be jazz guitar players, but we were stuck in the classical department, you know, in between when you had free time, which you never had free time, you know, we're in the dorm room checking out all these, you know, Coltrane and West Montgomery and all this, you know, you had these little windows of time to do these other things you wanted that you were interested in, like jazz and blues and all these other styles of music. But the whole time you're like, I got to practice, 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 perform, practice, practice, practice. Per so four years is nothing. That's, I, it's nothing. But what, what you said is, is, is dead on. You can't take everything so seriously. And like, you can't even say, well, in four years, I will be this and I will be playing this kind of music this way. And I'll be playing these gigs. It, who knows? I mean, do you just, just study while you're there those four years and, and taking as much as you can, but you can't really, you know, yeah. if that makes any sense, it makes perfect. Oh, yeah, ab ab absolutely. I mean, it, 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 this is one of those things that, it sounds like a banal platitude at the very end of, of a degree, you know, like what college does is it teaches you how to learn, you know, that kind of thing. That's actually a very profound truth. Um, I mean, at least in, in, in my experience, I, I find it to be absolutely true. And what the, um, what those years in, um, in, in college music, I think allowed me to do uh, was it gave me enough stuff to sort of ruminate on for the years afterwards. And then the, you know, my own sort of personal education really, really began. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and that's, I, I, I think it's, it's really worthwhile for that, uh, for that reason. Uh, but then you also have to give yourself the permission to then explore other regions and not necessarily feel so, completely beholden to the maybe some of the more dogmatic aspects of uh of of the education that i think we've we've all had you know some sort of part in yeah yeah for sure candace do, what do you think even about um just to move on because there's so many great questions coming in it's nice to to get everybody's thoughts on different ones maybe get your thoughts candace on peter's question peter rest it's really interesting one of the things i think writing and playing blues rock for many years brought me as in brought peter is an awareness of the importance of melody rhythm and having a hook when composing classical music i think some of the modern composers tend to forget even despise these elements which is a shame what do you think of, of peter's of peter's comment i really appreciate uh, peter's comment i was thinking about how i've thought about this often about the, the classical guitar music that I've chosen to play um, is that I'm in love with melody. And I thought it came from being raised by my grandmother who loved Dean Martin and, um, you know, grew up with and coming into things through through songs and, you know, and this idea of the guitar singing and melodic. And then even my favorite classical guitar players through the years 
or just this is have an especially lyrical aspect to their playing. And um, and I hadn't really thought of it as being because of, of playing other styles of music. Um, but I would just agree in terms of my own personal taste that I love melody in a very classic sense of that. Um, mm -hmm. And even jazz, uh, in terms of listening to jazz, I largely listened to in, uh, singers. Uh, John Pizzarelli, uh, of course, his, his father, not a singer, but Bucky Pizzarelli, Bucky Pizzarelli, swing jazz, things with these really recognizable tunes that I'd surprise myself that I know all the lyrics to them. Like, how do I know all the lyrics to these these tunes? So um, I don't know that, that that answers the question, but um, but I'm nope. certainly in love with with melody. But it's 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 exactly what then informs the the your interpretations of things, or of course, like the other music that you gain inspiration from. And it's like I I, I think what I would say about Peter's comment question kind of whatever it is really it's a mixture of both it's really really interesting it's so provocative is that i think that a lot of modern composition that that i'm interested in is very melodic and it's very rhythmic and it's full of hooks it's just dependent on where you're looking for things and and, and what you're what you're really interested in musically let's say or creatively but also to that point that he makes it always helped me play classical music better listening to blues and rock and jazz and pop music. It helped me f understand feel better and rubato better. Like the, 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 often, for example, when faced with um, a very classically minded teacher in a master class, the sense of rubato that they would accept and allow had a very, in my particular perspective, very narrow frame of reference from which it came. Whereas my frame of reference for something might be like, yeah, I know that this minuet could be at this tempo, and I know as part of a dance suite, this is what it its purpose is. And I know if we go back and try and play it exactly like how you know they played it in the day, which no one can actually say, but anyway, we can all sort of use historical record and get something close to it, we think. I would be like, I've just heard this rock band, and I would like to try it like this, you know, and play it half tempo and then speed it up here and then do something really wacky with it. And those ideas, I mean, those ideas in a classical music world where the parameters are in some senses like very um i'm not i don't mean narrow in a really derogatory sense i just mean like they're very tried and tested and there's an acceptance of sort of taste and that taste is to do with style and then that's all to do with provenance and that's very very interesting but it's it's particularly non-interventionist and it's particularly not about you it's about a form and a style and that's where i think interest in art is made when someone goes I'm just going to do it this way because I've heard this and I, I fancy trying this now, you know, and hell knows where I'm going to end up, but I'm going to try it, you know. Um, and so to, to Peter's point, you know, it just that it sort of struck me that that thing about like I always found a better way of playing what you would consider classical repertoire, often not listening to classical musicians playing, finding little fragments of something that I could draw across. It was like when Brower when Randy Rhodes stole the Brower issued idea, was it number six or, or something like that? Borrowed. That, he bought borrowed. Let's borrowed, not say borrowed. stole. Borrowed, borrowed. <laughs> but like even pieces by Nikita Koshkin, I'm sure there's a whole section of a Primus song in one of Nikita Koshkin's pieces. And like, you know, like I, if I, you, I go all the way through the classical guitar literature and go stolen, borrowed, mm -hmm. not giving that one back, you know, like, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a fantastic melting pot of things, you know? Well, I do want to share one in what I feel is a very important um, side of that, too, is that, um, like, I guess in defense of classical music, I don't know if we're not actually, you know, <laughs> criticizing classical music, but in defense, um, I mentioned that I play a lot of chamber music, and actually it was flutist who brought me up through classical music. So um, a lot of these lessons of phrasing and um, melody for me were honed through classical music as well, mm -hmm. but by playing with people who have to breathe. <laughs> and then it was a really interesting, the first time I played with a violinist who didn't have to breathe and we had played some of the same arrangements and the way that the cadences or um, phrases were treated differently between somebody who needed to take a breath and somebody who didn't 
was very different. The tempos were very different. And um, spending as much time as possible around non-guitar player musicians yeah. who, you know, are reading li linear music, who are leading, uh, reading one note at a time, who are reading um, melodies or second parts to melodies. Um, I think that issue is, it's not just saying that pop from, this is my opinion, but not just that pop or rock informs these things, but just being a part of the broader music, classical music community as well, because clearly there are brilliant, <laughs> expressive, melodic classical musicians. And I really need to thank every flutist, clarinetist and violinist who ever let me sit next to them in the past 30 years of my life, because they really, were the people who trained me outside the, of the guitar. The thank them all. Mm. Thank them all. Mm. <laughs> every single one of them. And you know, just to they piggyback on that. Their eighth grade, you know, flute pieces at half tempo because I was just <laughs> learning the Rosewood book at age 20. Thank you, all of you. <laughs> just quickly to piggyback on that. Um, I Like I teach high school kids and what I, one of the hardest things I think to teach a young student is to, you know, even if they can play technically, is to teach them how to play expressively because, you know, they have to open up their own, own own emotions to do that. So using other styles of music to demonstrate that and using people, who, you know, wind players or singers. I do that all the time because, you know, on a guitar, it's it, when you first try to play expressively, it's so abstract, I think, for a young mm -hmm. player. Um, but I think, you know, if I can point it out in maybe a style of music that they love, no matter what style of music that is, where they can feel that connection, that emotional sort of connection to it and then try apply it to the guitar because that's that's i just find that really difficult to teach a young player like yeah. open up you know yeah yeah play with feeling and they're like what what does that mean <laughs> yeah and that's yeah. why if you can tap into like how 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 i mean it's classical music is very very complex some of the times and you know the more contemporary it gets often the landscape you're going into gets more and more complex like sometimes you get a contemporary score and i'm like okay i need a compass a map seven weeks of sandwiches and like some water in case i get lost in the desert here and i can't get back home like you know and you, so the, the, the level of complexity goes up and up and sometimes it's very easy for like my sense of feeling to get very removed from this like my emotional response and reaction to it but not so much about other forms of music. So getting, and like you say, you, that's fuel. Like what you're saying there, then that's fuel of getting a kid inspired and interested in, in, in music. So, you know, not putting it away somewhere else, allowing it to come forward. And I'm gonna just uh, share another clip because this great question of have any of you genre hopped into flamenco? And I mean, if I hopped, it was more like stumbled and then <laughs> fell um, around flamenco music. But um, I think it's, it's time to hear like one of the most ridiculous, um, ridiculous for all sorts of reasons um collaborations trios um and it's obviously john mclaughlin aldi Mueller, and paco de Lucia. so three entirely different guitar players coming together There we go. Shred-tastic. <laughs> <laughs> well, so so I, I, I've I said, you know, I'm sure we all get asked, like, who's your favorite guitar player? Or who's the best guitar player? Like, that's a, that's a fairly common question uh, that yeah. we'll get after concerts or whatever. And I, <clears throat> I often say Paco de Lucia. Hmm? Um, and uh, it's it, largely because of his just unending facility. Uh, but also I, I, I was able to, to, to see uh, Paco and, and, and his ensemble 
uh, in the early 2000s, uh, very close to when he died. I only saw him one time. And um, it was a it was a really it was it was a magical experience. I mean, I, I couldn't tell you exactly what I saw after the concert. You know, like it, you it was so many things that happened in one show. There were so many styles that were represented. It was improvisatory, but it was also a, a lot of it was uh, composed out. I mean, there was dancing. There was you know, the, it was it was just this like incredible large very difficult to describe display of mastery um and uh, uh i think i think that's very much in display in that particular clip i know there were other clips i could have showed but <clears throat> i just had to go for the that's you know, the one the moment yeah. which, which you sort of like you realize that paco's looking over being like i'll slow it down just a little bit, you know, I'll just, I'll take the edge off it because you're obviously struggling with your pick there to, to just keep up. <laughs> I, happy and o, I and M, thanks very much. But anyway, um, it's just nuts. I mean, I don't know if there was any medicinal help to that performance of any kind, but like, you know, I don't know. It was just, it's phenomenal. I think there should be testing after all concerts now. That's what I'm, that's what I'm, that's what I'm thinking. You know, we all need to be on the same playing field here. Like, um, but, you know, it, that was obviously sort of a thing, and it's a it maybe has that gimmicky quality to it a little bit, like Sky. I don't know if like other than sort of joyfulness and sort of virtuosity and just being you know having your buttons pushed by listening to that in those ways, if there's anything hugely deep that came out of it. I mean, and, and that's me being maybe a little bit detrimental to the idea that those things aren't deep, like the frivolous and the, and the just like joyful. But like I, I, every time I put that on, I cannot help just be like, wow, that's nuts. It's just so much fun. You know? Nothing wrong with fun. <laughs> then you could put a shock to your record on after that and you'd have enough notes to last you for the rest of your life. Right? <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> I can remember my friends and I in college, like when we heard this, the, what is it? The Friday nights in San Francisco trio record. Uh, yeah. We're just like, Oh, let's try to play some of these riffs. And like quickly within three or four minutes, you're like, no, no, let's just play a blues. It's yeah, <laughs> slow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it's, 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 um, it, there, there is something about it as well that you could see or, or you can hear like, cause I, I, I looked around for like different examples and it was all coming back to that, that sort of one tune, but there are moments at which it's not exactly going that well. And I don't mean like mm -hmm. in, it's not fun and it's not free and it's not expressive, but you're like, somebody's a little bit behind someone else. Someone plays a chord. I mean, like it's not in tune, like, you know, no one tuned up. Like, you know, I was going to say that. Yeah. I was going to say, well, we, no, no one will notice. We're going to yeah. play so fast. Who's going to hear it? Exactly. Like, how important was that? You know, but like, I could, I could imagine just doing that as a trio at college and just being like, getting getting absolutely hammered for it you know because of those things not being right like you know not being in place not being so tidy you know um but it's not it's the energy of it and it's it's the sort of what's Aldi Aldi playing he's playing like a it looks like an ovation with like a curved back and like he's sitting like this and Paco's just looks you know I don't know like he's picking up his check and this is so easy and then you know a, a Jim McLaughlin just looks like some sort of old wizard in the corner like you know who's I don't know not actually touching the strings you know, just moving them with the power of his mind. <laughs> and then later on, wasn't Larry Coriel in that group? Because oh, I, 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 yeah. I, I remember seeing a PBS concert and, and Larry Coriel didn't, I, I don't even know if he knew where he was at the time. <laughs> he was <laughs> really like, <laughs> but I mean, you know, playing phenomenally. And yeah, it just didn't look like he knew where he was. You know, it's, yeah. For me, it's interesting because, um, if you have the same experience, it'd be great to hear it. But, you know, I came into guitar in 80s metal where speed ruled, you know, and, and shrapnel records and, you know, and and I have, um, you know, great friends who were shred, shred rock guitar players and great people, you know, um, not that they wouldn't be great people, but I just mean that what I'm saying is that I didn't play that kind of music and we just became friends because we have such intense love for what we're doing. And, um, but my point in that is that me coming into guitar at age 13, electric guitar and immediately getting into, you know, what is 
good at the time that's what was on the cover of the magazines and and um and this really fat you know speed was king so then growing into classical guitar by the time i was 19 or 20 it was actually music like this that was still the aspirational you know norm like to you know to listen to this and think yeah if only we could do that so it was interesting that you played this clip because i had to kind of check myself i was like yeah i thought that was really cool actually <laughs> you know and um yeah. but and don't forget also, we had you know a damaging part of that is because i was never a particularly fast player or at least i didn't think i was and it wasn't until now that i'm older and especially not as fast as i was when i was younger that i think wow i was always fast enough what what did i think why didn't i think i was fast enough but mm -hmm. i think it's because i grew up hearing stuff like this <laughs> and thinking someday and a lot of that stuff in the 80s was crossing over to classical. You think of Uli John Roth with the Scorpions and Ingve and yep. Marty Freeman and, you know, all those guys. They were doing, like, classical stuff, but loud and fast. So they were hopping, right? Does the crossover go easier the other way? Is it easier for, like, you know, I mean, even if I think of Sting as a songwriter and, like, having Andy uh, Summers in his band, a lot of those very clever lines you know, even in their construction, they, they hark back to like Baroque ideas or early music ideas of just like harmonic, you know, chord progressions. And then you have like Ingve and stuff like this and like the hair metal stuff goes so much towards like sounding like Vivaldi all the time. Like, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it, it seems easier. It seems like rock and pop music, when it steals or borrows from these ideas, it's a triumph. It's, it's super creative and it's considered like, you know, well, it's, not even better than what it was before, but it's all about enhancing. It's not about, um, again, sort of taking away. You know, I'm, I feel like I'm the old curmudgeon like guy here being like, why can't the classical players, you know, spread our wings more? But it, it, am I right in saying it? It seems like it's easier for it to go in the other direction. I, I don't know. I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure what, what I, what I see, uh, if, if there seems to be a thread in all of the music that we are listening to, and even kind of in our explorations uh, of our own biographies, there does seem to be this one little thing that <laughs> we're all talking about, which is sort of the dichotomy of naivete and sort of cultured music making. Mm -hmm. And anytime I've had, me personally, I've had good experiences moving from something I'm comfortable in, which is generally classical music, Western traditional classical music, mm -hmm. to other art forms. Where it comes from is finding that space of naivete or discovery where I may not be so comfortable. I may not be uh, so, I may not have so many opinions formed. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and discovering those those aspects, I think, at least for me, uh, has has is is where the sort of profound music making uh, ten, tends to happen. And I kind of feel, I kind of see that in, in the, uh, the Friday night in San Francisco clip, there's, there's like this real, there's a joy and there's like this kind of discovery that's happening. It's, a, it feels a little dangerous. Like you're not totally convinced that the other guy's got your back. You know what I mean? Literally that's, that's my read on the, uh, on the performance. And I think that might be one of the aspects that I find so incredibly exciting about that. I mean, that, that, and, and of course they're just technical capacity, which is, you know, mind blowing, but, but, but I think there's something else. I, th I think, I think there's something else really compelling there. There's some competition there. It's a little bit competitive. That too. I think it's competitive. I think they were all almost like held up as you're representing us you're representing us and you're representing us like you know so like don't screw up like you know because we want to be the fastest and the loudest and the best you know and i mean i'm of course i am like speaking for them then you know and i think john mclaughlin definitely might you know have a something to say if he heard me saying that but like you know there is definitely a, a there's there, there's a there's a there's a lot of testosterone flying around and it's kind of like you know it's obviously a thing like you know um but there's some that I think there was all there, there was a huge amount came out of it. It's just even listen to, to, to like Candace saying like you know, 
there was fast enough and then there was trying to be too fast you know like like in 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 your background when you were sort of and thinking back on it now it's like i find that fascinating as well it's like what we're chasing and why we're chasing it at whatever time yeah. it's an interesting point again it's 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 peter who um he's kind of in a sense developing the idea about like perhaps intellectual complexities of classical music sometimes um lead modern composers to lose touch with more primitive yeah, still important musical elements such as rhythm, melody, and jazz, blues, rock can help ground the modern composer. I'm not sure how much I would kind of agree with that, really. Just my, myself, I kind of feel like, um, I, and I understand that primitive is in sort of quotation marks, so we're sort of loosely th sort of thinking about that. But I, th I think, um, you know, it, it, it makes me think a little bit. Well, we had a comment before, and it was about. Um, Sean Shibe, um, and it was this electric counterpoint, and it was um, Philip asking, "Did genre did did Sean genre hop to play it?" And I was thinking, "No, not really, because you know how it's written in terms of the score, minimalism as well as as a form which kind of comes out of you know classical music and an experimental music and a bit of jazz as well for sure. But there's not for for Sean to play it. I think doesn't really take." a new skill so, so, as such. I mean, I know he's playing electric guitar, but I, I don't think in terms of the reading and putting it together in the rhythms, not so much. And I think often at times, to what Peter's sort of talking about here, I'm not sure that the complexity of uh, intellectual complexities in any way blur the understanding of like melody and, and rhythm and things like that and those forms. If anything, the composers, are maybe the people who are more creative sometimes than the performers in the classical world. So if I was going to twist Peter's criticism around, it would be more towards someone like myself rather than the composer. Probably the composer has thought about all of the influences and then tried to put forward this piece of modern music that I, as a contemporary classical player, might have the skills and the tools to be able to deliver. It's me that needs to be taking a lot of inspiration from all these different areas to maybe then better make that music speak. So I think I think the composers probably are the more open-minded often, um, and maybe they're taught to be like that as well with their lecturers and then, and the classes they take. So maybe someone else wants to jump in there, but that would be my kind of gut reaction to Peter's Peter's comment. Yeah, Stunned. I'm right with you. I'm I'm right with you. No, I I, I completely agree um, uh, uh, with that. Yeah. Yes. Well, there we go. Thank you very much, Peter. <laughs> um, Mike has just commented. Um, Matthew Cochran just touched mm -hmm. on beginner's mind, which is a joyful and wonderful place to be. Which is such a nice uh, nice comment. Such but nice but comment. I, but I think that I I, I think that's also uh, represented in 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 Vin's. Uh, kind of uh, rediscovery of roots music, and then Candace's kind of never walking away ever from you know like your uh, initial musical impulses. I th I think there's there's some real bravery there. So yeah, well I think, yeah, I think we have to remember why we make music. Sorry to cut you off there. No. I mean that, I think it, that's the important thing. I mean why do we do this? You know what are we trying to communicate with people? And you know that pure passion that we all have as musicians for for writing and for playing you can't you can't forget that that's the important part and sometimes we get so caught up in the you know the criticism or the you know or the genre it's mm -hmm. it's just making music that you love to make and trying to say something to an audience um that's true and genuine i think that's that's probably one of the most important things that we can't forget just thinking back on that and, and what um, Matthew said earlier when we were talking about fast and what's too fast and what aspirations are you going for. You know, I was thinking about this today that they're in preparation for today. You know, there are so many ways to be a musician. Just being a musician means a lot of different things and it can mean different things to each of us throughout our lifetime. And just because we've done one thing whether that's a job or um, a type of music, you can do it and it's actually okay, you know, we, to allow ourselves to say, okay, I want to do something else now. And then, but we also, there's constructs that are built either by ourselves, our own perception of what, you know, the music scene is or actual feedback that groups of people are giving us. Um, and so if you are in a, a classical guitar scene where 
um, or any, not classical guitar, anything, jazz, whatever it is, and you're, let's say, around a group of people who are really quick to express opinions, and you are coming in in a naive beginner's mindset, and you look up to these people, you know, you really take their opinions to heart. Mm -hmm. And it may take decades. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm sure we even have many of us this experience with people who have been teachers or mentors in our life that we really took their word and their opinions as uh, mantras and that it's taken a lot of our own personal life experience and taste and to build this kind of self-esteem where you can trust in yourself and um, and go forward with things and find your own voice. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've had several experiences where um, I did things, whether it was a concert program or recording a CD. And um, I really had an artistic vision in mind and, so, and something I was trying to do. And I, you know, put it out there to either friends or colleagues and um, the feedback wouldn't be anything, you know, it'd be kind of just flat. And you had to find the courage or I had to find the courage to go forward with what I was believing in and just do it. And then even releasing it and not really getting particularly great feedback from anybody, even being afraid, you know, to share things. And, you know, it took me a, almost a year to send my CD Reverie to Classical Guitar Magazine for a review. And when I did, I got a review that I, so amazingly positive that to this day, I couldn't imagine I ever got this review. Hmm. And, um, but at the time when I first put the CD out and was kind of sharing it with a few people, like, what do you think? You know, I wasn't, it was, I wasn't getting the feedback that I expected. And that's just one example. There's been many things. And I'm not saying this to like share praise of myself. I'm, I'm really getting to a point for other people here, which is that um, uh, there's other things that I've done that many years later, somebody I admired told me something really nice about it. But at the time, they had never said anything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can carry a lot of self-doubt and even hurt, you know, in, 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 um, you know, I have just an in, in, in inner way that I'm just going to keep on doing what I do. But it would be nice, you know, that you get feedback sometimes that's supportive. So I'm just putting that out there because in this this whole discussion about exploring other styles and, yeah, if, if you don't have experience, you know, coming to college, you've never played classical guitar, you don't know these particular chords, you don't know these particular techniques. Yeah, there's a bit of surrender to to learning. And, and getting more information behind our opinions and, and that kind of thing. But there's also a real importance to, um, how do you say this? Like growing yourself and knowing your inner voice and, and um, believing in it and, and finding your path and, and being able to do it even if you're not gonna get all of the, the outward support and recognition for it that, that you might want or need. I hope, I hope, I hope, I thought that was pertinent. I hope it was. That's fine. You're here. I mean, well I think said. it's interesting because there's been a few, there's been a few comments from people who obviously have just quite recently been students or are thinking about education. And we've naturally talked about that. Like there was even the question posed about like, what would the four of us think could you know, change in education and could be different and could support the fact that naturally guitar seems to want to genre hop. And also naturally guitarists are interested when they come to say a more classical formal study, they're already interested in electric, blues, class, you know, all these different styles. And it's not about shutting them down. And it's it, and then that, you know, what you've just said there, Candice, is, is talked to the, the appreciation of how you do things at different times and like the, the the journey with it like you know you might you might have something that really affects you at a particular time you're looking for a particular type of feedback and gratification in a way for whatever purpose it doesn't come and then it comes from a different source or it comes further down the line I mean we all have had mentors in our journeys and people that you know have said something to us it's been really important along the way and maybe we haven't heard it right at the right time or we heard it wrong, you know, or we misinterpreted it for lots of different reasons. And 
we've been asked some quite, I think, challenging and quite direct questions about about education. And even what's maybe useful for students watching this back is all four of us come from very different backgrounds. All four of us produce, I hope, interest in music and have careers in music and have a life in music. So therefore, our discussion and I think everybody's been so sort of just honest and straightforward with what they've what, the, what their experiences have been and what they've meant to them. That is in itself useful information because it, it, it helps people not take it too seriously or it helps people realise that it takes time, you know, and that your own opinions change over that time because of your experience. So I think it's not just pertinent, it's like kind of crucial. But just maybe, just just because I, I, know, I know we've been on for longer than we, we usually do, but there's not really a, a time limit. But, um, you know, I don't want to keep everybody here, you know, all night as we could. Um, but I thought it'd be really nice to play a clip of like one of the grandfathers of classical guitar, like one of the the original Deutsche gramophone um, artists, uh, Joran Socha, an amazing guitar player who came out with a record, Bach and Beatles. And it was one of these records that just became like huge in, 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 in the music world, not just the classical music world. And um, I wrote to Goran the other night and he said, yeah, you can play a wee clip of yesterday if you want. So we're going to just, I mean, it's not huge and hopefully it encourages everybody to go. Goran's got an amazing YouTube channel and I think he's just sitting at home now, maybe not playing as many concerts as he used to. I hope he won't mind me saying that. And he's just recording these stunning uh videos sometimes on six string sometimes on 11 string guitar he obviously has a beautiful space there and he's just and he's putting out these performances now of these tunes that were that he made famous these arrangements that he made famous of these beatles tunes so just in terms of crossover and genre hopping and also instrument hopping really as well this is just a great clip to share Wish I could share more. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's that's so stunning. What a what a monster! What a, oh, <laughs> just love that guy's playing so much. Yeah, so, uh, honestly, everyone should go and listen to some of these performances. They're absolutely beautiful. Um, but listen, I think we just maybe it's maybe that's the right time to just sort of you know bring the discussion to a close, unless anybody's got anything burning that they want to that they want to get off their their chest. But we've just had some amazing. We've had amazing comments as well from people that have been watching, and obviously people will see the the recording of it later as well, and you know might go on to comment. But it's been a pleasure to have you both with us, Finn and Candice. It's been so nice. I have one right. quick, very quick comment, which is just because yeah. there were students on here. Um, you never know where your music career is going to take you, and uh, when I finished my bachelor's degree, I had very humble goals in mind of just being able to make a living playing music and I had no idea like I couldn't have dreamt the things that have occurred between age 22 and, and my age now so um and a big part of that's being open to learning and and um so whatever style um yeah you, you never know where where it'll take you and that's the most amazing thing is from now to your end of days you have the opportunity for an unending learning experience. Yeah, and to add to that, nowadays the way music is, the music business and recording and everything, you never know who's going to hear your music or your performance because it's just out there. So you, you might be very surprised who, who listens to you. So just be yeah. passionate about it and enjoy the process. I think that's it's a lifelong process, and you know, not to get hung up on the right now. Just just learn to love learning and enjoy the process. Yeah, and if you if you if you if you are too stigmatized by a particular genre as well, you are therefore limiting the amount of people that, as Finn says, might actually hear your music and might give you a break that you never expected getting. And that's that's an important thing for I think a young guitarist today is to allow the you know the way you present yourself doesn't in a sense turn off an, an entire audience that you could that could love your music and love the way you play, and also people that might be very influential and sort of putting your career 
forward or, or helping it move forward. Okay, well, thank you all so much. Thanks so you know, much. Thank you for the for the comments too. Thank you, thank you for these just insightful and 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 deep uh, thoughts coming from uh, both uh, Candace and, and and Vin, and also uh, uh, from uh, those of you who are who are writing in. Great. Well, we'll see you all next time. We don't know what the topic will be. If there are any topics that anybody wants to suggest, please do. Um, quite often my patrons uh, that support the Galilee Guitar, they help shape the conversation and sort of suggest, could you try and talk about this? Could you get people on? Um, so please, um, if anybody does have any ideas, let us know. Anyway, until next time, thank you all very much. <laughs>